Let's stand and pray before we get into God's word. Lord Jesus, as we open up the word that you left for us, I pray that the opening of your word would bring light. I pray that you would prepare our hearts, God. I pray that by your spirit you would push away the billion different distractions and that we would be able to look at you. We would be able to look at your word and receive from it its life-giving message. Help us understand it for what it truly is. Lord, we thank you. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Open your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we'll, we'll be preaching on the first 10 verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul continues his thought and he says, working together with him, that's with God, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance and affliction, hardship, calamities, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left through honor and dishonor. Through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors, yet, tr yet are true. As unknown, yet well known. As dying, and behold, we live. As punished, and yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing everything. This is the word that the Lord has left for us. And the first thing I want to point out is, notice how does Paul refer to himself here, friends? How does he refer to himself? As a servant of who? A servant of God. He says, verse 4, But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. And what's interesting is here in chapter 6, he's actually quoting the Old Testament. I don't know if you caught that or not. Usually your Bibles will separate and show it. And what he's quoting is Isaiah 49. And in Isaiah 49, in that same chapter, there is a segment that talks about the servant of the Lord. And, and in fact, Isaiah has multiple of these called servant songs. And there's these descriptions of the servant of the Lord, this mysterious servant of the Lord. Well, we know as Christians now, you know, understanding what Christ has done, we understand the servant of the Lord is who, friends? Christ, Jesus Christ, especially Isaiah 53, right? The suffering servant. So it's interesting that Paul is quoting the part of Isaiah that talks about Jesus being the servant of God. And we know Acts calls Jesus the servant of God as well. Paul is calling himself the servant of God. Anybody else want to guess who else are the servants of God? Us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All of us, we are servants of God. If you, friend, call yourself a Christian today, then the Bible calls you a servant of God. Did you realize that? Is that a part of your identity? Romans 6, says, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, it's an even stronger word. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. 1 Peter 2.16 says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. And you know that being a, a part of being God's servant is being a representative of God. 
uh, uh, and that's why Paul in v- chapter five, just a few verses right above that. And by the way, a reminder, when Paul wrote this, he didn't split into chapters or verses right before that verse 20 he says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. Meaning we are representing Christ. We are representing him because we are his servants. And so all of that being established, what I want to do is before we get into this text, I want to understand the context Right? When we read, friends, we have to understand the context. What is being said here? And you know why we look at the context of Scripture? Because we believe that Scripture is breathed out by God. These are not just ordinary words. This is not just some spiritual guys that had some spiritual thoughts and they wrote it down. No, no. These are the words of God that are breathed out for all of humanity and they've been standing here for thousands of years. And we believe that all scripture is profitable and useful. And we believe our goal when we read the Bible is not just to have a feeling of inspiration or encouragement, although that's a good thing, but our goal is to comprehend with our mind the message that God actually intended to communicate through these specific words, amen? Like we want to understand the intention that God had and then apply it to our lives. So what is happening in this context? Chapter 520, Paul writes, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, meaning be restored, reconnected to God. The first verse of chapter 6, he says, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, meaning receive it well, effectually. The very next verse says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So what Paul is doing is he's writing to the Corinthian church. I'm giving you the context. And he is calling them to repentance and renewal. There, maybe there's people in the Corinthian church that just don't know Christ. They think they know him, but they don't know him. So he's calling them to repentance. Maybe there are those that have actually genuinely repented, but they have begun to stray from God. And so he's calling them back to the Lord, back to the grace of God, back to Christ. He's saying, hey, here's God. Be reconnected to him. And then that's why he says this very curious phrase in verse 3. Read with me. He says, we put no obstacles in anyone's way. He's calling them to repent and come back to God. And he's saying, there's this path. And by the way, we don't put any obstacles on this path towards God. And in fact, he says the flipped opposite, kind of the inverse of this phrase in verse four, he says, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Meaning commend in Greek, the word means to stand besides, to give support. He's saying, hey, we, we are making sure that we as servants of God, we are putting no obstacles, but we're doing everything we can to point people back to Jesus. That's, that's what Paul is saying. In other words, we're confirming our witness of Jesus by doing all these things, which we're going to look at. And that's the main point of this passage, of this chunk that we just read. Paul is saying we're pointing people back to Jesus. We're removing obstacles, and here is how we do it. And that's what the rest of this message is all about, is how do we point to Christ How do we remove obstacles from our life in order that others seeing us may go to Christ and not turn away from him? So the first way that we confirm our witness is through the bad. We've seen this in verses 4 through 5. Remember, if you've been here with us throughout this series, you'll remember that the Corinthians, they were very suspicious towards Paul. They, they had a lot of, you know, they were saying a lot of evil things about him. They were thinking he was trying to manipulate them and use them, right? And so Paul is trying to, in a sense, win them back, right? Because he understands that what he's telling them is true and it's good. And if they reject him and the message, well, then they're rejecting the gospel and they're rejecting the truth in Christ and they're being led astray. And so 
his first point of why he is legitimate, of why he's truly pointing to the real gospel and to the real Christ, is how he handles the trials and tribulations. That's the first point. We confirm our witness by through the bad, through the trials and tribulations. Read with me verses 4 and 5 right now. <clears throat> but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. How? By great endurance in affliction, hardship, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. What he's saying is, he's saying, look at how I suffer. Corinthian church, look, look at me, look at how I suffer. And I'm going through all of it with great endurance. I'm not grumbling. I'm not murmuring. I am going through it with endurance. In fact, verses 4 and 5, they contain what theologians call the three triplets of trials. The three triplets of trials. The first one is affliction, hardship, and calamity. He puts it together. This, and, and that's kind of what, you know, just general problems. Then the second one is beatings, imprisonments, riots. What's the common thread there? It's something that people do against you, right? The evil that people do against you. And the last one is labors, sleepless nights, and hunger, meaning th this is self-imposed suffering, whether intentionally or unintentionally, but for the sake of Christ. He's saying, look at all this suffering, all these trials that I'm going through. And he's saying, through all of it, I go through. There's one common thread with great endurance. Friends, it is the difficult times in our life that really show who we are inside. Do they not? Our reaction to the trials in our life, no matter which triplet our trials belong to, will either strengthen our witness and point to Christ more, or it will have the complete opposite effect. How are you reacting to your trials? Through the pla places where you are being tested right now. Proverbs 17 verse 3 says, the crucible is for silver. That's where they would melt the, the precious ore. And the furnace is for gold and the Lord test hearts. When that metal is heated up, it is the impurities that come to the surface because they are lighter and the precious metal sinks to the bottom. What a testimony it is when it's heated up and nothing comes out. It's pure. It's gold. It's silver. You know, it reminds me of Paul and Silas in Philippi. We read about in, in Acts 16 how they got attacked by the crowd. And, and they came and they beat them with rods. And after they, they beat them up, they put them into jail. They put them in jail. They, they fastened their feet to the stalks. And do you remember what happened at midnight? What were they doing? They were singing. They were singing hymns. They were praising God. I mean, in that furnace... In that furnace, all the prisoners were listening, and all of a sudden there's an earthquake. And all the, all the prisoners are freed, not just Paul and Silas. And the jailer runs in, and he knows, according to Roman law, he has to die because his prisoners ran away, and he's ready to kill himself. And Paul says, wait, wait, we're all here. None of us ran. We didn't run from these trials. We stayed. We were faithful. And it is in that moment that he says, runs in and he says, what do I need to do to be saved? The way Paul and Silas handled their trials, the endurance that they had through that difficult moment was a testimony that pointed the jailer to Christ. They removed those obstacles and they seeing him, seeing that endurance, he repented. You know, it's easy to say for us, I believe in God. God is my all. When we have all that this world has to offer, everything's provided, everything's good, right? It's easy to say that. I'm not saying it's easy to mean it. I'm saying it's easy to say that. So, friends, being a Christian, being a servant of God, I just want to remind all of us, in, in a sense, 
It is not going to be easy. Pointing to Christ is not going to be easy. We all have difficult circumstances. We all have people that try to hurt us intentionally or unintentionally. We all have to make sacrifices because of which we will suffer. Friends, give up the hope of an easy life. Here's the application of this first point. Do you find in your heart the hope, the hope for an easy life? I do. I see that in myself all the time. I want the easy life. I want, the, I want comfort. I want, I want to click the easy button all day, every single day. But we must abandon the hope of an easy life if we are to take our faith seriously. If we are to be faithful servants of God. Where in your life, what area in your life are you hoping life could just be a little bit easier? What's that area? And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should make our life more difficult than it already is, <laughs> right? We don't have to like sell our car and now walk to church and work, you know, uphill both ways. Like that's not what we're supposed to do. That's not what I'm saying. We should make it easy if we can while still honoring God. But we all know the difference of making our life easier in a way that will not bring glory to God, a way that will not honor Him. Paul suffered because of circumstances, because of people, because of his own self. And he went through all of it with great endurance. He removed all those obstacles. And the question for us is, can we, like Paul, say to the watching world around us, look at the way that I suffer? And I, I'm so convicted by that. I don't suffer well. I don't go, even tiny little problems, I don't go through them well. But, but that's how we point to Jesus. When you come home and you're exhausted and the kids are running around, how do you react? What kind of witness are you creating for the unbelievers that are closest to you, the ones that live in your own home? When your tire pops on your way to work, what kind of face do you walk into that building with? Is it pointing to Christ or is it just showing that we're just like everybody else, just people of this earth. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's what we strive to. People need to see in us an endurance that only God can produce. This is not something we can produce. This is not something that we muster up with our own self-will. This is an endurance and a power we get from God, and that points people to God. That's the first point. The second point is we confirm our witness through the good. And this is found in verses 6 through 8. Let's read it again. And I'll read verse 4 one more time to remind you of what he's talking about. He says, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. He talks about his trials. And then in verses 6 through 8, he says, and also by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and for the left through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. The first thing on this list that God gives us is purity. Can the way that we speak and the way that we act, can it be described as pure? My friend was telling me recently at his work, they have quite a bit of Christian people. And then they've got some who aren't Christian. And, and, and they'll come to work and, and, and they'll start, you know, cussing and everything. And, and nobody else joins him in that. And all of a sudden he feels a little awkward, right? We've had the same thing at our company. We've had enough Christians where we didn't have a culture of cussing. And people would come in and they'd start cussing a little bit and they'd notice that no one else joins them. And they, they stop and one guy's like... Hey, man, I noticed, like, nobody cusses here. It's kind of awkward when I cuss, you know? In all my other companies, we would all do that all the time, and it was not a problem. Uh, what, what's going on, right? And it's, it's, I'm not just talking about cussing. This is just one example. This, this clash of cultures, it's, it's clear. 
when people will walk in purity, purity of speech, purity of behavior, purity of even our humor. Is our purity pointing people to Jesus? Or is it pushing away, people away, the lack of our purity? The next thing we see is knowledge. It says we commend ourselves by knowledge, meaning we are not just content with being a Christian. Like, oh, I'm a Christian. No, Paul is saying we have knowledge, and that commends us as servants of God. We are knowledgeable in the things of God. When we see that people are knowledgeable about God, when people see that in you, in us, that points them to God. And here's the reality. Everybody is knowledgeable in something, right? You know, some people say, oh, no, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable in this. Oh, everybody is knowledgeable in something. I mean, you just ask someone, like, what's your favorite sports team or your favorite car or your favorite hobby or whatever it is, and he's going to tell you the exact specialty bread to buy in this little mom-and-pop store so that you can go and catch rainbow trout in the Sierras during, you know, the month of July. Like, it is very specific knowledge. We all have very specific knowledge. That's just human beings. We grow in knowledge all the time. And I'm not saying it's wrong to know all the fishing hacks and tricks and tips or to know, you know, your favorite car and the engine that it has. But we should also be knowledgeable about the things of God. When people come in contact with us, do they walk away with the impression of man? Not is he knowledgeable, but... You know, when we, when we walk away, when we talk to someone who's crazy about a certain hobby or a sports team or something, we're like, wow, he really cares about that. That's what we walk away with the impression with, right? Are people walking away with the impression of, man, he really cares about what the Bible says and what, what God says about this world. Do people walk away with that impression? That's how we point to Christ. And friends, being knowledgeable in God's word is not for only pastors and people that stand up here with the Bible. That's not who it's for. It's for all of us. If you're a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, growing in the knowledge of God is for all of us. And you know, a really good example of this are our brothers and sisters from the Russian service, the, 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 those who are more elderly. I mean, you talk to, you stop one of those grandmas and you start talking to them. She's like, oh yeah, I was recently reading in the book of Proverbs, you know, and she starts telling you something that really stood out to you and you're just encouraged listening to that. And you think, man, you're 80 something years old. You've been reading the Bible your entire life and you are still digging into it. How? They get it. They get it. They want to grow in the knowledge of God. And friends, that kind of knowledge, it's contagious, is it not? When you see that, you're like, oh, I want more of that. The next thing we see is patience. And it's very similar, patience, endurance, very similar to that first point, but there is still a distinction. Theologians say that the Greek word for endurance is when we go through challenging circumstances well. For example, you're driving, your tire pops, and you don't lose your mind, you don't yell, right? You just calmly, patiently go through that trial. That's endurance in the Greek. The word for patience in the Greek Bible is usually used in relation to other people, right? It's when someone steps on your toe literally or figuratively. It's when someone rear ends you, right? And how do you react towards them? That's where the word patience is oftentimes used. So the question is, how do we respond to the people that hurt us? How do we respond to the people that hurt us? Because the way we respond will determine whether we put an obstacle on their path to God whether they're Christian or not, doesn't matter. Or whether we will push them away. Because you know what? Everyone that wrongs us, whether intentionally or unintentionally, they know in their heart of hearts that they did something bad to us. They know that. They know that. 
And they expect us to react the way any other human being would react, right? Some sort of attack back towards them. But the Bible, Romans 12, 14 says, bless those who persecute you and do not curse them. When we respond in a way that's unexpected, it points to something beyond this world. It points to someone who is beyond this world. It points to Christ. The next thing we see is kindness. Paul was commending himself through kindness. And this is a question for all of us, and for me especially. Are we characterized as a people who are kind? You know, kind people are empathetic. They're respectful. They're generous. They're helpful. And in a society that's obsessed with, you know, achievement and, and career and all these goals and everything, we, we, we tend to de-emphasize the importance of kindness from one person to another. And that just means that we as Christians, we have even a greater opportunity to shine that light of Christ in a society that doesn't value kindness. The next up, Paul says, the Holy Spirit. Is our life characterized with, as being filled with the Holy Spirit? Can we describe our life that way? Are we praying in the Spirit constantly? Is it evident that He's living in us rather than the Spirit of this age, right? Are we putting to death the deeds of our body by the Spirit? Romans 8, 13. Because a spirit-filled and a spirit-led life will point people to Jesus. The next is genuine love. Now, the Greek word for this is literally unhypocritical love. Love that is not hypocritical. And, and uh, genuine love is not the same thing as being just, you know, nice to people. Sometimes usually we're nice to people so that they would like us, right? It's a very selfish kind of uh, emotion. And it's not wrong. Uh, but usually we're nice to people while they're in front of us. But as soon as they leave, there's nothing positive that remains in our heart towards them. But genuine love is love that is there even when the person isn't. Genuine love is love that is there even when the person isn't. And you know what, friends? Over time, people can easily tell the difference between genuine love and fake love. In fact, fake love, it pushes people away. In a way, you could say it's worse than no love at all. But genuine love, it resonates with every single human being. We all know what genuine love feels like, and we are gravitated towards it. People want to find that source of that love, and where's the source? God, right? Genuine love is not a love that we have towards people because of what I can gain from you and the little benefits I can get from you, but it's love that God is working in our heart supernaturally to love this person just because. That love points to Christ. The next step we see is truthful speech. And what Paul is saying is we don't put an obstacle before anyone because we are honest. We speak truth. You can trust what we say. What we say is what you get. What you see is what you get. I love uh, the example of Yaroslav Derdienko. Maybe some of you know him. Maybe you don't. He was uh, a good man from our church, uh, one of the elders from our church. He is with the Lord now. He's actually one of the key uh, initiators behind us building this building and moving from our Solano campus. And in his career in the Soviet Union, Everybody knew he was a Christian, and one of his defining marks was his honesty. It's very interesting. And his boss, he loved and he hated that about him, right? Because someone would call the office, and he picks up the phone, and his boss is like, say, I'm not here. And he's like, here, tell him that you're not here, <laughs> right? 
I know it's bold, but you know, obviously they had a good relationship. But when we walk in this kind of truth and this kind of integrity, that becomes a part of us that points to Christ. Because if people can't trust our speech, if people can't trust us to be honest, are they going to hear anything that we say, friends? Anything? Nothing. Just absolutely nothing. It just cancels everything else we do. It's like a log that falls on that path. It's the ultimate obstacle. And that's it. You can't cross that path anymore. The next up, Paul writes, says, and the power of God. Now, we don't do miracles like Paul does or didn't back in the day. But God's power still works today through our prayers. So many testimonies of, of the people of God praying for, 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 for God to do, just for example, you know, for people in the hospital. And then something unexplainable happens and the doctors are confused. We're not confused because we know exactly what happened, right? We ask God to do it. Now, I'm not saying that God's going to heal every single person that's in the hospital. Now, Jesus didn't even heal everyone in the nation of Israel when he was on earth. That wasn't part of his plan. But when we as Christians, when we rely upon the power of God instead of our own power through prayer, that becomes a testimony to this watching world. And then Paul says, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. He gives a more expanded list in Ephesians chapter 6, if you remember, the whole armor of God. And in there he says, take up the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, the shield of faith we take up with our left, we hold it for the defense, right? And it blocks the flaming darts of the enemy. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, is what we use to fight and attack back Spiritually, a Christian who does not walk by faith, a Christian who does not hold up the shield of faith from the flaming darts of the evil one is like a fish that's just plopping on the ground out of water. You can't live by faith. You can't, sorry, you can't be a Christian and not have faith. You will be the fish out of water, suffocating. And a Christian without the sword of the Spirit is one who can never fight back in any spiritual battles. You just get defeated every single time. But when we walk by faith and when we wield God's word rightly, our life will point to Christ. We will be his ambassadors. And lastly, there's this verse 8 of this point. It says, through honor, we commend ourselves through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. Now, it's interesting, the Greek word for honor here is uh, glory. It's literally glory. It says, through glory, right? And it's very interesting because he's saying, we point to people even through glory. Like, how does that make sense? How does that commend you? You get glory. How, what does that work? And here's what we see very interesting we see that abundance, glory, praise, prosperity, they pose their own spiritual risk, right? Remember, we, we said, what, what's point number two? We confirm our witness through the good. Well, sometimes the good can be spiritually risky for us. You know, those good things in life, they can actually catch us off guard. And they can ruin our witness before God, right? It's easy to say that God is good when things are going great, but just because you say it doesn't mean we mean it. Praise and flattery, glory, it can get to our head and it can make our head big. Glory can make us coast and become complacent. That's why Paul says in Philippians 4, 12, he says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. I, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty, that's abundance, and hunger, abundance, and need. Meaning, I know how to be a Christian down there and up there as well. It's hard to love God in the good times and the bad friends, both. And the devil uses both strategies to try to destroy our faith. The big difference is it's easy to pretend to love God when things are going good, because everything's going good. Why not, right? In fact, some argue 
that it is harder for us to be faithful Christians in abundance. I remember I was talking to a pastor. He said, man, back in the Soviet Union, it was almost easier to be spiritually strong because it was clear. You're either a Christian or you're not. You're either in and everyone hates you or you're out and everybody loves you. It either, the world either disapproves of you or it loves you. But now, he said, even this lack of just even social persecution, we don't have persecution. Let's not kid ourselves. We don't have persecution here in America. Even the lack of social persecution, we can just relax and get distracted by the abundance of this life. We start focusing about building our life here instead of building our life there with Jesus. Friends, the application of this point, God gave us a big list here. We've covered a lot, right? And that's okay. The goal is not to drink from the fire hydrant. It's just to get wet, okay? So just get a little bit wet. The question is, what has resonated with you from this list most? Don't worry about chasing everything, but, but looking at this list, purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, Holy Spirit, what resonates with you most? Pick one. Just pick one area. And when you go home, work on that area this week. Tell someone else about this area, someone else spiritual, and say, hey, God's convicted me of this. And every day, try to change something in your day-to-day -day life in this one area. And the other application is, how are we handling the good times, the good things in life, the abundance that God has blessed us with? And by the way, um, in case you are all wondering, we all live in abundance. Do you know how much money you need to make per year in order to be in the top 1% of income in the entire world? Anybody want to guess how much you need to make per year? $30,000 a year. If you make $30,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of the entire world. So I think we all qualify for us living in abundance. And lastly, the last point, we confirm our witness through thriving in trials. Let's read the last part of this passage. And again, remember, Paul is, he's commending himself as a servant, removing all pops, uh, all possible obstacles from people's path towards God. And the way he does this last, he describes in verses 8 through 10. And, and as we read, look at the contrasts. Look at the contrast. He says, we are treated as imposters and yet are true. As unknown yet well-known. As dying and behold, we live as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. This is an incredible list. If you look at that first half, the left side, oh man, Paul is just miserable. Everybody thinks he's a liar. He's unknown He's dying, he's punished, he's sorrowful, he's poor, he has nothing, he's broke. Nobody wants this for himself, right? And it's interesting because this point, it kind of relates to that first point of like, you know, going through the bad. How this point is different from the first point is Paul doesn't just come back and start repeating like, hey, look, but look, I'm also enduring these other things of being unknown and dying and punished. No, no, Paul, Paul talks about that, but he changes his emphasis. He's saying here, we're not just enduring through all these bad things. We're going to look at the second half list, but you'll see what he's saying is we're not just enduring. We're not just getting through it like just well. We're not just handling it like a champ, but we're actually thriving. We're flourishing in the soil of hardship and trials, right? That's what he's saying. And that's how he's pointing to God. He says, look at all the horrible things happening to me. And I'm not just getting through it because that points to God, but I'm actually thriving through all of it. And this shows that I'm, I'm a legit servant of God. I'm not an imposter. I love you, Corinthians. 
I love God and I want you to be reconciled to God. Let's read the second half of this list. Paul says, all these horrible things are happening to me and yet we are true, well-known, alive, not killed, always rejoicing, many, m- making many rich, possessing everything. You get the polar opposite picture here. We're not just surviving. You know why we're not just surviving? Because something so much bigger is at work in us. And that something is God. This is not just a human thing at work. We are thriving. We are truly God's people. Humanly speaking, there's no way that we'd be able to handle all these things. We would just collapse under the pressure or be bitter at best. But two chapters before in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says, but we have this treasure, the treasure is the gospel, in jars of clay, that's their body, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. He creates this contrast. He says, there's this beautiful treasure and it's in these clay jars, this dying body. This gospel is being spread by these people that are dying and perishing and wasting away. And it's having such a tremendous effect. The gospel is thriving throughout the whole world through these weak people. Why? To show that the power belongs to God and not to people. And Paul is making a similar argument here. He says, look, all these horrible things are happening to us, and yet we are still thriving. Why? Because the power belongs to God, not to us. Friends, this is what being God's servant looks like. There will be so much adversity, friends, challenges, setbacks, spiritual attacks. You know that, I don't know if you've noticed this in your life, when you've set your mind on doing something for God, right, serving God or doing something that's right, did you notice that you get attacked spiritually? Anybody notice that? I was talking to a pastor, he was saying, man, you know how I know communion's around the corner? because I get in an argument with my wife, right? He says, it's, it's so consistent at this point that, that I'm like, why am I not arguing? Oh, that's right, communion's coming up, right? It's a reliable reminder of that. Why? Because the enemy hates it. When people want to live for Christ, when they want to give their best for him to be his servants, to be his witnesses, and he's going to try to make it difficult in all kinds of ways. But friends... That's just half of the picture. We have a God who holds the devil on a leash. Amen? And, and, and he will only let him go as far as is according to God's perfect plan. Not an inch more. And not an inch less. You know, Charles Spurgeon, I was reading a biography of his And, you know, everybody calls him the prince of preachers, right? And yet often we don't hear about how much suffering that he went through. And he didn't just survive it. He thrived through it. One of his biographers says, on top of physical suffering, Spurgeon had to endure a lifetime of public ridicule and slander sometimes of the most vicious kind. In April 1855, one newspaper had an article with these words. His style is that of a vulgar colloquial, varied by rant. All the most serious mysteries of our holy religion are by him rudely, roughly, and impiously handled. Common sense is outraged and decency disgusted. His rantings are interspersed with coarse anecdotes. Another newspaper wrote about him and said, he is a nine-day wonder, a comet that has suddenly shot across the religious atmosphere and he has gone up like a rocket and long before will come down like a stick. In just two years, his wife accumulated all these things, evil things that were written about him. And in two years, she had a huge scrapbook of all these public criticisms against him. You know, I'm sure that some of it was easy to brush off, but most of it wasn't. In 1857, he wrote, he says, Down on my knees I have fallen. 
with hot sweat rising from my brow under some fresh, hot slander poured upon me. In an agony of grief, my heart has been almost broken. We usually see just the thriving part of Spurgeon. Oh, but he was rooted in the dirt of adversity. And he continued to thrive, and God used him to save thousands of people throughout his lifetime. That's what thriving is, friends. It takes a miracle to thrive in those kind of circumstances. And in Christ, each and every single one of us, not just Spurgeon, not just Paul, we have access to this miracle. Let me show you why. For Paul, it didn't matter if people called him a liar because he knew him who is the truth, right? Jesus Christ, John 14, 6. And he preached only the truth. So he can't be a liar if you're constantly preaching Christ. Yes, Paul might have been unknown to some of the churches or some of the people in the world, like on this list. But in Christ, he was fully known. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. He was fully known by the only one that matters in this universe. The only one that we need to be known by. God. Yes, Paul was dying. And, oh, and he was punished. He was pushed into the dirt. And yet, he was still full of life. Because he knew that his life is hidden with Christ. Colossians 3.3. 3, and that he would live forever because of Christ even after he would finally and fully die here on this earth. Yes, Paul had many sorrows. He had many pains in his life. And yet he wrote in Philippians 4.4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. The same phrase, always rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. He was able to rejoice, not just, just in general, but in the Lord, in the Lord, he found the ability to rejoice always. There's always room to rejoice in Jesus, friends. What are the sorrows on your heart right now? What's that rock weighing you down? Jesus promises to comfort all of those sorrows. Every single one of them. Revelation 21.4, Jesus promises it. We know that with Jesus, we win. Amen? We win with Jesus. And he will make all things right. And he will make all things new. He will remove that weight. Going on, Paul was poor. Yeah, he was. But he knew that because he preached the gospel, the everlasting, eternal good news, he knew that when people would repent and turn to God, well, guess what? According to Romans 8, 17, people become the heirs of God. Meaning we are now on the list to inherit all that God owns. What does God own, friends? Everything. Absolutely everything. Everything you see, anything you can think of, all of it belongs to God. And the Bible promises us that if we believe in Christ, we are his heirs. We will receive from him everything. You can't make someone more rich than being an heir of God. You can't. You can't be more wealthy than that. God owns all things and he will give us all things. And yes, Paul had nothing, as he says, having nothing. And yet he knew that he himself being in Christ, he was also an heir of God. And he knew that in Christ, he possesses everything. He knew that when Christ recreates this world without sin, without evil, guilt, death, pain. Do you know that Christ actually promises us, friends, this is mind boggling. He promises us in Revelation 3.21 that for those who persevere, meaning those who have true faith, that we will sit with Christ on his throne. How insane is that? Why would God promise us that? I don't know. But he does. We will sit reigning and ruling on his throne. 
And that's why Paul has the courage to say, yet we possess everything. Because he knows where he will sit when all of this is done. Friends, Paul knew the treasure that he has in Christ. He knew how precious Jesus really is. He knew the life and the joy in Christ. And that's why he was able to thrive in all these circumstances. Oh, that we, friends, today, here in 2024, October, that we would cling to Jesus as closely as Paul had clung to Jesus. That we would remember the life and the joy and the wealth found in Christ. That we would hold closely to him and that we would experience him as precious that he would be our all in all. And that like Paul, we would be able to say, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count it as garbage. Why? In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him because of the surpassing worth of Jesus. Help us, Lord. And dear friend, if you are here and you're not a Christian, man, we're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're here. Maybe you're curious about Christianity. I just want to encourage you. Consider Jesus Christ. He is more than just a historical figure, a person that just lived and died one day, or maybe something, I don't know what happened to him. No, no, no. He is the creator of the entire universe, and he is the savior of our souls. The wrath of God is coming upon this world because of our evil doings. And only if your life is hidden in Christ can you be saved. And can you live forever in eternity in joy in the new world that has nothing evil and nothing bad. But you must trust in him. You must leave your sins, turn to him, and follow him. You have to do that. You have to give your life to him. He has to now be the boss of your life. Trust in him. I was reading today in the Psalms, it says, today, if you hear hear God's voice, do not harden your heart. If God's voice is speaking to you, don't harden it. Open it up. Soften yourself to God. Turn to him and let him do the rest. I want to conclude this last point. And you know, I just want to clarify one thing. You know, when we, when I talked about thriving in trials, some of you might think, oh, well, God wants to make me prosper here on earth. Like no matter what bad things happen, I'm going to prosper, right? But that's not exactly what thriving is talking about. Thriving means not thriving here on earth necessarily. It could be but thriving for God and His glory in eternity. You know, um, what does it take to plant a church today? Friends, think about this. What does it take to plant a church? Like, if, you ha- if we as a congregation decided to plant a church, by the way, we should, uh, what would it take to plant a church? Money, okay, great. People, and, and lots of prayer, right? people, money, prayer. Do you know how the church was planted in the second century? Tertullian, he was one of the theologians and and early church fathers of the second century. You know what he said? He said, the blood of the martyrs is seed of the church. They planted churches. No, God planted churches through the blood of the martyrs of those who died for Christ. You know why? Because people would watch faithful Christians come into the Colosseum and be torn up by animals, and they would see their unwavering commitment to this Jesus, and it would make them question, and it would point them to Christ and they would come to know Christ, and people would get saved there, and then they too would die for Christ, and that would point other people to Jesus. And so the church was planted through the blood of the martyrs. In fact, did you know that Christians invented the word martyr? Because the word martyr in the Greek, they didn't have a word. 
in the Greek, it just means witness. If you look up the word witness in Greek, it's martus, right? And they just use that word to refer to people who would die for Jesus. If you died for Jesus, they would say you were a witness for Jesus, a martus for Jesus. We made the word martyr. We invented it. And this is, you could say, the ultimate example of thriving for God's glory despite all the circumstances that are going on. Yeah, thriving might not feel good here and now. Oh, but what an eternal impact we can have for Christ if we are faithful, if we're just faithful to him. So, recapping all this, we are God's servants we are his ambassadors, we represent him, and we are to point to Jesus, and we are to confirm our witness, and we are to do it through the bad, we are to do it through the good times, and we are to do it through thriving in trials. And by God's grace, when we do that, people will see Christ. Amen? Let's pray. I'm going to give you a minute of just quiet response time, and I'll pray in conclusion. Lord Jesus, we come before you, I come before you, acknowledging that I fall so short. Acknowledging that we cannot do this on our own, God. We can't be good witnesses to you, Christ, without your help. And so we plead with you, help us point others to Christ, to this watching world, God. At the end of the day, the only thing that will matter is whether someone is in Christ or not. God, I pray that we would see your preciousness, cling to you, for you are all that we have, and that we would thrive for your glory and not ours. I pray for anyone who has not yet walked in that path to you, God. I pray that you, they would walk to you and they would be saved and they would know the joy and the life that's found in you, the wealth of Christ. Lord, we thank you. We worship you. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen.